So one of the things that we need to unpack when we're thinking about offer and acceptance and whether or not we've reached agreement is what happens when there is no communication of acceptance. Now the seminal case in this area is Feldhaus and Bindley, which we will have spoken about in class if you're listening to this after a class, uh, or if you're lucky enough to be looking at these before you come to class, know that we will talk about that case in some detail in class. The one I want to focus on here is an exception or an exploration of the circumstances in which silence can amount to acceptance. And the case is a 1988 New South Wales case of Empanol Holdings and Mackin Paul. I hope I'm saying the name uh, properly. Um, I hope I'm not saying it incorrectly is what I'm trying to say. So in this case, um, Empanol is a property developer and it had a particular director and major shareholder. His name was Eric Jury, uh, who was, sounds like he was a bit of a character. Uh, he was a major shareholder and he stated that he just didn't sign contracts. He either trusted people or he didn't and he wasn't going to sign a document. Mac and Paul was a firm of architects and project managers and they provided or tended to provide services to Empanol. Uh, Empanol engaged them to draw some plans, to get some uh, approvals in place and do some other work in relation to property development. Empanol asked Mac and Paul if they wanted to be project manager for the ultimate development and they said yes they would and they were asked to get started. Um, Mac and Paul then sent them a copy of their standard terms and conditions. They requested some progress payment and they asked that the written contract be executed for the building works. At this stage, Mr. Jury said again, I don't sign contracts. Uh, the management team said Mr. Jury won't sign a contract. Even so, Mac and Paul proceeded with the works. They sent two copies of the contract with a request that one of them at least be signed and returned to them and they requested a progress payment. Ultimately, progress payments were made, but unfortunately, Empanol fell into receivership at some point. So Justice McHugh held that under the common law, the silence acceptance of an offer is generally insufficient to create a contract. Because, firstly, the objective theory of contract requires external manifestation to the assent to the offer. Convenience, particularly commercial convenience, has given rise to the rule that the acceptance of the offer needs to be communicated to the offeror. After a reasonable period has elapsed, silence is seen as a rejection rather than as an acceptance. And the common law is opposed to the notion that people need to take action to reject an uninvited offer because otherwise they might be bound by contractual obligations. In this case, however, this general rule didn't apply. Silence of an offeree in conjunction with other circumstances could in fact indicate that the offeree had accepted. In this case, we had an offeree who had had a reasonable amount of time to review and reject the offer of goods or services, even so had taken benefit from the goods and services that had been provided, and they had done so under circumstances where it was very clear that there was an expectation that those goods or services would be paid for in accordance with the offer, which was in fact the contract terms that Mac and Paul had provided a number of times. The ultimate issue here was whether a reasonable bystander would regard the conduct of the offeree, including their silence, as signalling to the offeror that the offer had been accepted. So in this case, Empanol had accepted the work that had been carried out by Mac and Paul and took the benefit of that work with the knowledge of the terms on which it was offered. Empanol knew that Mac and Paul relied on being paid for the work and an objective bystander would have concluded that Empanol accepted the offer on the terms and conditions that they'd had the opportunity to negotiate or reject. So in some cases, we can actually have silence as acceptance, which appears to be contrary to the rule in Felthouse and Bindley, but it's not silence alone. It's silence 
connected to this other conduct and this idea of reliance, which is deeply embedded in the idea of consideration, which we'll get onto in the next topic. As always, questions, you know where to find me.